Adventures in Research. I tell you, I saw it with my own eyes. He sent a message from one room to another by wire. X-ray, X-ray, read all about it. Message sent across ocean without any wires. X-ray, read all about it. What has gone wrong? This is Paul Shannon introducing another in the series of programs dealing with the thrilling adventures to be found in the field of scientific research, as told by the men of science themselves. Our story today by Dr. Phillips Thomas, research engineer of the Westinghouse Research Laboratories, is called Electronics in Communication. This is the story of man's invisible messengers, the electrons, and how they were harnessed to carry his words throughout the world. It is more than the story of electrical communication. It is a tribute to the progress made by civilization. Jungle drums thumping through the thick, dank air of the tropics. Indian drums throbbing through the oak-lined woods of the western world. Voices in the night. Hammering news of a celebration. Warfare. Warning. And then, another beat. The rhythmic pounding of horses' hooves on the hard-packed road to Lexington and Concord. To arms! To arms! The British are coming! To arms! To arms! The British are coming! Westward moves America, fighting, struggling, pushing its frontiers farther into the heart of the new world, lengthening the distance over which man's words must go. It is the year 1825. In a house in New Haven, Connecticut, a young woman lies ill, gravely ill. The physician at her bedside wears a troubled look on his face as he speaks softly to the other woman in the room. I don't know. It looks pretty hopeless. She's taken a bad turn. Oh, Doctor, is there nothing you can do? I'm afraid not. I think it's best to notify her husband as quickly as possible. But can we get the message to him in time before she goes, Doctor? Now, we can try, and that is all. I'll see if I can get an urgent message through to Washington on the boat that leaves here this afternoon. And the postmaster may know of a courier riding overland to... But I'll try, Doctor. Please do. He'd want to see her so badly before. before. There. There. I shall utilize every effort at my command. Excuse me, Mr. Moister. I hate to disturb your painting, but a letter just came for you from New Haven, most urgent. Oh, well, thank you. I'll take it. Urgent, eh? Now, what could that be? Wait just a minute, please. No. Is something wrong? Yes. Yes, it's very serious. I shall have to leave at once. Immediately. Oh, uh, yes, please tell Monsieur Lafayette I shall be unable to finish his portrait. Uh, Do that, please. I must pack immediately. Doctor, how is she? I got your message a week after you wrote it. I came as quickly as I could. Is she gone? Now, Sam, you must get hold of yourself. We did everything we could to get word to you in time, but it just and the funeral. <coughs> last week, Sam. Just last week. That man was Samuel F. B. Morse one of America's foremost painters. This tragedy taught him the need for rapid communication. He never forgot it. Morse continued his artwork, traveled to Europe to study and to paint. It was October the 6th, 1832, aboard the packet ship Sully, bound for America, when the answer to the question of rapid communication came to this painter with a scientific turn of mind. 
He was having dinner in the ship's salon with an interesting group, including Dr. Charles Jackson, a resident of Boston. Yes, gentlemen, this man Henry has hit upon something quite unique, to say the least. Electromagnetism, you say, Dr. Jackson? Yes, Mr. Morris. But I'm surprised to find a painter interested in these scientific things. Not so surprising, Doctor. I've attended many an interesting lecture on electricity. Amazing. Then you'll understand, no doubt, that what Henry has done is to bend a piece of iron in the shape of a horseshoe and wind it with wire. Then he sends an electric current through the wire, and the iron magnet will pick up another small bar of iron. The electricity travels instantly through the entire length of wire, you see, and thus causes the magnet to act. I see. Uh, tell me, Doctor, could electricity be made to go over many miles of wire almost instantaneously? Yes. Yes, it could. If electricity is present in every part of the circuit, I see no reason why messages may not be sent instantly by electricity. Uh, you'll excuse me, gentlemen, please. I have some very important thinking to do. Some very important thinking. Well, how odd. How extremely odd. Transmit messages by electricity over miles of wire. Doctor, I got your message a week after you wrote it. The iron bar becomes a magnet which will attract another iron bar. We did everything we could to get to one to in time. Each time the electricity travels through the... That's it. That's it. Telegraph. Writing at a distance. Eighteen thirty five, the first telegraph instrument to send and receive. Built by Samuel Morse in his rooms at the College of the City of New York. Length of wire for transmission seventeen hundred feet. Eighteen thirty eight, now assisted by a young graduate of the university, Alfred Vale. An improved instrument to send and receive. Length of wire for transmission stretched around a Morristown, New Jersey factory, three miles. And the telegraph clicked away, if only in the hearts of Samuel Morris and his assistant, Alfred Vale. Without funds, against stubborn, popular opinion, they kept up their long fight for recognition. Finally, in 1843, a bill was introduced in Congress. Mr. Morse, Mr. Morse! Just a minute. Well, Annie Ellsworth, come in. Thank you, Mr. Morse. I can't stay but a moment. Have you heard the news? The news? But of course, Father just got word at his office. It's about the bill. Yes, it passed Congress. President Tyler has signed it. And the appropriation, it's for $30,000. For a telegraph line from Washington to Baltimore. Isn't it wonderful? Emmy, this is the best news I've heard in a long, long time. And you shall have the honor of composing the first telegram. And on May 24th, 1844, in the Supreme Court Chamber at Washington, in the presence of some of the nation's most prominent figures, Annie Ellsworth's message was written into communication history. Carried on the wings of electricity over 40 miles of wire from Baltimore to Washington came the meaningful biblical quotation, What hath God wrought? Then in 1876, in the attic of a Boston house, a strange contraption is built by a man named Alexander Graham Bell and his aide, Thomas Watson. This attic has been their laboratory, where they have worked long, tiring hours to develop an improved communication system. Now, Alexander Bell exclaims, Mr. Watson, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. And in a room adjoining, Watson is surprised to hear, Mr. Watson, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Mr. Bell, I, I can't hear you. I can hear the words. The wires are talking now, carrying the voice with the speed of light. 186,000 miles a second throughout the world. Now across the ocean, 
A young man named Marconi, the son of a wealthy Italian gentleman, is thinking of the scientific experiments of Heinrich Wilhelm Hertz. Hertz, huh? So he has proved Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic waves. Hmm. Invisible waves can be handled like polarized light waves. Radiation, eh? If the radiation could only be increased, developed, and controlled, it ought to be possible to signal across space for considerable distance. Yes. Marconi set to work immediately, determined to accomplish his aim. Wireless communication. From the scientific pioneers of an earlier day, he took the induction coil, the Rigi gap, the telegraph key, the batteries, and a receiving device known as a coherer. Wiring them together, he put them to work. Alfonso, there it is. We've sent a signal and received it through the air just as I visioned it. No wires, no space, only space. Here, come over to my side of the table and you send a signal. From one side of a table to the other, wireless. From one room to another, wireless. Across the channel, Great Britain to France, wireless. December 1901, the first wireless signal links two continents. By 1909, regular commercial service across the ocean was a reality. And in that same year, aboard a ship in the Atlantic... A man new at his job, the radio man, hears in his receiving set. Distress call. Liner SS Republic in distress of Sandy Hook. Our course, our course, 11 degrees starboard, full speed ahead. The first distress call for help by radio, CQD, later changed to SOS. That call saved hundreds of lives in what would otherwise have been another tragedy of the sea. Wireless had already won its laurels. Now come the Fleming Valve to improve radio reception, the DeForest grid tube to amplify, to generate radio waves, to modulate the waves with voices. Throughout the world, amateurs experiment with wires and coils and tubes, with dials, antennas, and crystals. Hey, Pop, what you doing? You know what I'm doing, so don't ask. Trying to get this crystal set of mine to working. Can you hear anything when you put those earphones to your ear? Sure. What? Static. Now, go away and play somewhere else. You're making me nervous. What are you supposed to hear in the earphones, Dad? Well, Frank Conrad said he was going to tell us on this radio how the election came out today. Well, I'm figuring Harding to beat Cox for president. It's about time they should be saying something. I can't hear a thing so far. Who's Frank Conrad, Dad? Uh, he's a scientist at Westinghouse. Now, now, be quiet for a minute or two, son. Hey, 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 hey this is all right. Hey, hey, come here, son. <laughs> hey, your father's a real radio man. And listen to this. this. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have the first returns in the Harding and Cox elections. Just a minute, please. We'll have them for you. Gosh, Pop, that, that's radio, isn't it? Yes, that's radio. November 1920. Out of that first election broadcast by KDKA grew the special features broadcast over hundreds of stations today. Out of the dreams of men like Morse and Bell and Hertz and Marconi and a host of other adventurers in research came the reality of rapid communication. Out of man's struggle with the unknown came words on the wings of electronic energy, swifter than sound, as fast as light. Thoughts of man are traveling around the world on a highway of electrons at work. And there you have another story by Dr. Phillips Thomas, research engineer of the Westinghouse Research Laboratories. Another of mankind's thrilling adventures in research. (laughs) 